Okay, Isaiah chapter 1 through 5. As I said in my prayer, people never change, but the great thing is that God never changes. Now, you think about that for a second. People never change. But, and I'm not talking about you here, because this church is, is awesome. You know, and the Lord is really doing a great work. But when you look at the church that's out in the world today, things don't change. There's still sin within the church. There's still idolatry within the church. There's still harlotry in the church. They're still believing the culture. They're still hanging on to their traditions, to their works, their self-righteousness. That doesn't change. You know, and I was thinking about this, and I got a little self-righteous thinking about all the other churches, you know, and all that's going on out there. And I thought to myself, you never change. Are you still dealing with a lot of issues, Reuben? You know, you know I, I was asked to, to share this coming Friday at a couple's dinner. And I'm like, man, am I so unworthy to share at a couple's dinner? I'm not a good husband. I mean, what am I going to share? I mean, how am I going to minister to them if, if I can't even minister to my own wife? You know, if I can't be what God wants me to be as a husband to her. And and boy, do I lack. And and you know that. I've shared with you where I came from and where I'm going. There's so much more that I need to crucify in my own life with my wife. The conference was just so life-changing for me. I mean, it really caused me to look at my life in some areas where I need to to really start changing. You know, my relationship with my wife, I think it's a great one, you know, as long as it's from my perspective and as long as it's, you know, what what direction that I'm going and so forth. It, it's when there's another direction that she wants to go that's not always so great. And I'm always talking about how you should love your wives and honor your wives and as Christ loved the church, and you should pray with your wives. And the Lord really convicted me. Are you praying with your wife? And I do so often, but I'm not consistent with it. And I was just really convicted. I'm like, Reuben, and you're going to teach at a couple's dinner? Why are you going to do that when you're not even praying with your wife? And so I got up this morning, and I woke her up at 8.30, and I said, let's pray, you know, and just grabbed her, and we laid there in bed, and I hugged her, and I just prayed for her just prayed over her, prayed over all her fears, prayed over all the things that she's going through, praying for strength, for love for her sons, for her grandchildren, you know, and then asking for forgiveness for myself. I think, boy, I never change. There's still a lot that I need to change. And that is never going to change. That goes for all of us. We're not perfect. If we were to examine ourselves and be honest with ourselves, I am sure that you'll find some areas in your life that you're hanging on to and you don't want to give up. But here's the key. And this is the great thing about it, that God never changes. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He still loves us just as he loves Israel. And Israel put him as a father and as children, gave him, you know, excuse the word that I'm using, but hell. You know, I mean, outright rejecting him and and going contrary. The law, we don't need the law. We don't have to follow the law. We're going to get into the culture. We're in the Babylonian society now. We're assimilated into the system. We're going to stay here. We like it here. We don't want to go back. And God says, you're rebellious, you know, to the core, to the depths of the heart. And yet, he said, I still have mercy and grace for you. I still love you. And I'm going to draw you back. And one day I will set you up and you will worship at Jerusalem in purity and holiness. And I'm thinking, wow, Lord, you never change. You know, he's the one we need to keep our eyes on, right? Is God, not on each other. Because if we keep our eyes on each other, then we fail. And we're going to fail and we're going to be disappointed. Uh, Don't look at me because I will disappoint you. But look at Christ, he'll never disappoint you. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we're going to see that as we go through here. It is just awesome to see 
what an awesome God we serve. What a loving God He is. And how willing He is to forgive. And you know, after I prayed with my wife, I felt so good. It, it was like God said, see, I give you this peace. I give you this presence of my, and I feel His presence. You know, it was just like, wow, Lord. I mean, just how quickly you are to come right in and say, I just love you that much more. You know? Because you do the right thing, and God just has so much for us, and we're going to see that today. So let's do a little bit of an introduction here, and we will get through these five chapters. So the book of Isaiah is a narrative history. As you know, Solomon has divided the kingdom after his death, and it's kind of split to the northern and southern, and um, all these wicked kings and very few righteous kings begin to rise up and really mislead the people in the wrong direction which caused God's judgment to come upon them. So it's a narrative of that history. Uh, The prophet Isaiah wrote it approximately 760 B.C. Chapters 40 to 66, they believed, came at a later date, probably about 680 B.C. Isaiah is the first book of the section that we call the major prophets compared to the minor prophets. Now, major in that the books are just bigger. You know, there, there's a lot of chapters compared to the minor prophets where there might be three or four or five, seven chapters. And that's the only reason they call them major or minor, not that the message in it is major compared to a minor message. It's the same message of God and they're both important. They're called, um, I'm sorry, um, the key personality in this book is Isaiah, his two sons, and a couple of other guys that we will be looking at, and the children of Israel, of course, the southern and northern kingdom. The period of Isaiah here, and the whole history is unfolded in 2 Kings 15 through 21, and 2 Chronicles 26 through 32. So if you want to do some homework, you know, throughout these next few weeks as we go through the book of Isaiah, read those chapters, 2 Kings 15 through 21, and then 2 Chronicles 26 to 32, and you will get the history of when Isaiah was writing. And it will kind of make more sense to you. Let me say it again. 2 Kings 15 through 21, and 2 Chronicles 26 through 32. And if you missed it, then um, just go on the website and you can pick up the, uh, the chapters there and re- listen to the message. Isaiah was a contemporary of the prophet Hosea and Micah. By the time of Isaiah, the prophet Elijah, Elisha, Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, Amos, who was also a prophet, had already completed their ministries. And Isaiah, came, Isaiah contains some of the most incredible prophecies of all the books in the Bible, including the, the, the prophecy of the virgin birth you know, and the suffering Messiah coming who would uh, bear our iniquities and our sins. It contains the foreknowledge or what we would call prophecy about the Messiah and the future reign of the Messiah. Not just his coming, but also his second coming. Now Christ came and walked among us as a human being, as God in the flesh. That was his first coming. And then his second coming will be at the time that he comes to judge the world. Now, oftentimes we get it confused with the rapture and we think, well, he comes for the rapture. No, he doesn't come to the earth for the rapture. We actually go to him while he's in the air. So it's not that he's coming for us. We actually go to him. We're caught up in the air with him. And then we go and have a great wedding feast in heaven. Can't wait for that because I love to eat. I mean, you're going to have everything at those tables and you're going to enjoy it all. And you're not going to have to worry, and he'll be in your presence at the groom. You'll be the bride, and this is going to be such a great celebration. And then while the tribulation period is going on here on this earth, then he will come back to judge the earth at his second coming. And Isaiah prophesies concerning that second coming. God calls and commissions his prophets to declare to Judah and Israel, in this book, condemnation. So there's a lot of judgment taking place here. A lot of conviction But yet, great hope that the Messiah is coming and he will die on the cross and take away their sins once and for all. And so, as I said, people never change. We never change. You will not be perfect. I know that you will not be perfect. I hope you know that I am not going to be perfect because we're human beings and we have skeletons in our closets that we still hang on to. 
We have psychological problems in our minds, what we think is right and how we apply certain things, and yet they're not because it's just our upbringing or social background and, and so forth. And we're trying to do the best that we can in allowing God to work through us through the Word of God penetrating our hearts and changing us through messages, you know, through conferences. When we go there and we realize, wow, I didn't see that before. Why is it that I missed that? And there's so much that God is still working in our lives, but He never changes either. And His grace and His mercies are always there with open arms for you because He loves you. And it's about a relationship and not a religion. See, religion is based upon your good works, And that by your good works, you can maintain this relationship with God and blessings from God and love from God and receive from God and so forth. That's religion. Relationship is this, like a child who messes up. And and as a parent, you love them no matter what because they're your child. You know? And they may mess up big time, but you still love them. You still love them. I mean, I don't know how many times I have had people tell me about my son's you know, as though I'm going to go, oh, I'm not going to love them anymore. You know, because they, they saw them or they heard this or they, you know, seen that. And I'm like, oh, oh man, I'm not gonna, you know, they're my sons. And they'll always be my sons. They'll always be my children. And I will love them until the day that I die. And people don't understand that because they're standing from the perspective outside of your family but they understand it from the perspective of their family because they, they love their children no matter what. And their children are the best children and, and they'll never forsake their children. I mean, I've seen families, that their children you know, get divorces and, and, and have affairs and, and, and get into homosexuality and, and all these things and yet the parents are still there for them and they still love them because they're their children. And so... God doesn't do that with us, though. He corrects us. You know, if we go off and we sin and we do some error, He'll correct us because He loves us. And a good parent will always do that with their children, too. But He always loves us because it's a relationship. And He'll wait. He'll wait for us because He loves us that much. Let's break up these chapters. Um, Let me just break it up in in two ways, just, just so that it's easier for you. In chapters 1 through 39, it's going to deal with judgment. The judgment of the, the northern and southern kingdom of Israel, Judah and Jerusalem, um, 1 through 39. And then from 40 to the rest of the chapters is going to deal with the redemption, the coming Messiah, the promise of the Messiah, the hope that we all have in Jesus Christ. And we'll see that at the end of this book, which will be awesome. So let's get into the book. The vision of of Isaiah, the son of Amos, here, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. Now, this isn't the prophet that we just spoke about. This is the name of his father. Which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah. Now, we're going to see Uzziah uh, in chapters 1 through 5. And then we have these other kings, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, king of Judah. Hezekiah will play a main part in Isaiah's life. Again, you read those chapters and you will get some understanding. Second Kings chapter 15 deals with, with Hezekiah. Now, it's interesting that Uzziah, some say that Isaiah was related to Uzziah, possibly a cousin of some sort. And so you can understand Isaiah dealing with the kings there, having access to the kings, and being a prophet of God and able to go to them and prophesy of the coming judgment of God upon them because of their sins. And so dealing with those relatives, you know, that he has. I love that about God, how he saves families, you know, how he saves families. He starts with one person in a, in a family, and then that one person shares with the brother or a sister or, or an aunt or an uncle or a mom and a dad, and next thing you know, it just kind of spreads, you know. And God does that because he's interested in saving families, not just individuals, but whole families. And so he's dealing with these kings now. It says, Hear, O heaven, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought you up, children, and they have rebelled against me. So here God gives a legal charge against his children, Judah. Look, I brought you up. I nourished you. I gave you everything that you needed. I've been there for you. When you were hurting, 
I helped you. When you're in pain, uh, I relieved that pain. When, when you're in bondage, I released you from bondage. You know, when, when they were going to attack you, I made sure that I put a wall before you. You know, God was always there for them, and yet still, they rebelled against him. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. What is he saying there? He's saying the animals know better than, than you do. Here, the animals know. I mean, a donkey knows his master's crib, you know. An animal knows when the master's calling, and yet you don't even consider me whatsoever. In the mornings, Virginia will go out the sliding glass door, and she'll scream, Wilbur, you know, our pig. And that little pig, you hear him way out in the backyard, and he just starts running because he hears her voice, and he knows he's going to get food. You know, and he knows he's going to get a lot of food, and his belly's empty, you know, because he's over there eating, and he wants some more. And so he just comes running. If Wilbur understands the master's voice, why don't we consider the master's voice? Yeah. But we don't, do we? How many times has God spoken very clearly to us, very clearly, and we don't listen? We don't listen. Yeah, but I'm not ready for that right now. God, I know what you're saying, and I know I need to do it, but uh-uh, I don't want to do it right now. It's not the time. Just leave me alone. I don't want to hear it no more. You know? Now, that's a relationship, and I think it's an honest one, but we miss out because we're not considering the Lord's voice and consideration of what direction He wants to go. He says, That last sinful nation, He says, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers. Listen to how He describes the children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backwards. Now, again, the word backwards meaning they've walked totally contrary to God. They just said, see you later. I want nothing to do with you anymore. I'm going to live my own life the way that I want to live it under my rules and my direction. Don't tell me what to do. In total rebellion. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. You got a sick head. (laughs) He says, your head is sick. And the whole heart faints. From the soles of uh, of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. In other words, you're empty headed completely. But wounds and bruises and petrifying sores, they have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Because of their unrighteousness and their rebellion, even their land suffers. Now, as we read through this, is it kind of giving you an image of the United States? It is, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? People never change. We never change. Even the church the, you know, the church is, right now at this point, it seems to be one of the major moving uh, vehicles for the church today to, re- to, to receive the culture's idea of what marriage is, right? With homosexuality, lesbians, and, and gays, and so forth. And so the church is receiving it, and, and now they're proclaiming that the Bible never talks about homosexuality being wrong. That the, 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 the scholars who are saying that, that, that it's not in the scriptures, and so people are believing this. They're believing this. And what's happening? What's happening to our nation? Storms, Katrina, floods, you, you, tsunamis, you know, various things like this. I mean, millions of people displaced and having to move to other places because now there's just homes empty, desolate in, the, in our eastern or western part of our nation, right? Why is that? Because our land is desolate because we don't consider God. You know, just a, a great picture of the United States. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in the vineyard. Now, um, the picture there is you have a vineyard. You had booths that were set up throughout the vineyard, so you can just climb up the booth and you can oversee the vineyard, the laborers and so forth. But it's empty. The booths are just sitting there. As a hut in the garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, unless the Lord of hosts has left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. In other words, we would have been totally destroyed. But God in His grace, and because He never changes, there's always a remnant. Isaiah's a remnant. 
Isaiah's a remnant, he's a prophet. And, and Daniel's a remnant, and Shadrach, Meshach are remnants. And you're remnants because you love the Lord and you want to serve the Lord and you're asking the Lord to use you in the kingdom of God. So you're a remnant. You're a voice in the wilderness. You're a light and you're salt to the world. And so we're all remnants that are sticking with the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And we're applying it and we're using it. And so we're all remnants. But there are some that aren't remnants. There are those that want to live their own life. Don't want God's direction. Don't want God's leading. They want to do it their way. As, as uh, Frank Sinatra said, I did it my way. And of course, he's still doing it his way in hell. You know, unfortunately, got to do it God's way. You know, why do people make it so hard? Why do I make it so hard? It's really simple, isn't it? Just be obedient to the Lord. You know, just get into his word. Just pray and just say, Lord, help me to be obedient to you today. Help me to love you. Just put a song in my heart. Give me an opportunity to share my faith. You know, let me work hard to pay my bills. You know, let me serve our church, Lord. Let me be active, Lord. It's really easy. It really is easy. But we make it hard. Oh, no, I, I just can't do it. I got to work, and you don't know the money I need and, and, and what I need to do and take care of. Oh, no, I just can't do that. It's too much of a commitment. And, you know, we make it harder. And, it, and the only thing that happens is it gets harder and then harder. And then we're wondering, why is this so hard? Because you're not obedient. You're not faithful. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And it's just really simple, but we make it so hard for ourselves. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Now he's talking about their, their empty religious rites and what they're giving. And so God is going to correct them on that. So, so here they think that their sacrifices are something. And he says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Says the Lord, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams, fatted, fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the lambs or goats. When you came, and came to appear before me, who had required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacrifice or the sacred meetings, your new moons and your appointed feasts. My soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wow. Now I know I emphasized it a little bit, you know. But I mean, you, you get the idea. The guy says, I don't want your sac- I hate, it doesn't smell good. Don't come to me with your sacrifices and offerings and you're coming religiously. Here, Lord, yeah, here's my big old sacrifice. Put it on the altar there. And then you're getting on your knees and oh, thank you, God, that I'm not like so-and-so, Lord. Thank you, God, that, you know, that I get this great liberty to do this and that. And God's saying, I'm not even listening to you. I'm closing my eyes and I'm going, la, 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 I can't hear you, you know, until you repent and turn from your sins. I mean, he's sick of religious rites. It's not a religion. It's a relationship, right? But yet the church gets confused because we get confused over religion and relationship. See, that's why I like Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel, one of Calvary Chapel's distinctives is where God guides, he provides. If God's in it, he'll take care of it. We don't have to do anything, but we do something. I was talking to one of the pastors at the conference, and uh, he was saying, isn't it interesting how we, we make so much effort to go in a certain direction to reach out to the community, and they were telling me that they were, were, were doing this outreach. And they said it was so funny because we did this outreach, we poured a, a what was it, I forget what he was called, he called it like the, the five fives. For five months, they went out five days passing out you know, tracks and so forth, some, some name. He goes, we didn't see one person from it. But then all of a sudden, from another place, people started coming. And it's like, what, what's going on there? I go, I know, it happens to us all the time. And they, they, then they told me, yeah, we, I was talking to somebody at Harvest, one of the pastors there, and they said the same thing. We, we focus in this area, but then we get no fruit, but then the fruit comes somewhere else. You know, and I said, you know, it's, it, it's like God. He just wants you to know that it's not you and your works. It's him. Here we go. But he wants to see you faithful, right? He wants to see you doing something. 
But he wants you to understand it's not you doing it that's going to cause a church to grow. It's not you that's the answer to the problems of the community. It's God. And when we just worship him and just love him and say, Lord, this is your church and you add to it when you want to add to it, you know, then you, you, you be glorified. And I love that because then there's no pressure on me and I don't have to, to work and I don't have to impress and I don't have to. Um, and, but yet some people demand that of you and think, well, it's not going to happen until you do this or you do that. No, it'll happen when God is ready. When God is ready. And I think we've seen that here because the church has grown. It's doubled. This time last year, it doubled from that point on. And I haven't done a thing. You know, just said, Lord, you, you do it. And he's done it, you know. He's done it. Didn't do anything different. I didn't, I didn't try to do anything different, you know. It wasn't the chairs, because we got the chairs after, <laughs> you know. It wasn't the cement or the grass, because that wasn't until July or so, August, somewhere around there, you know. It's just the Lord. And I think it's our faith and trust that he's going to do it according to his word, like he said. But religion, he's sick of it. It's relationship. Now, go to him and say, Daddy, Daddy, I mean, we, we want to be used by you, Dad. Oh, would you use us here in Mariloma? Would you do a work? And I think he sees your heart. Daddy, would you use me, with my family, my, my brothers, my sisters who just need to know you? Would you give me your heart to see them lost without Christ going to hell? Give me your heart, Dad. I may have it. And I think if it's sincere, he'll use you in a great and mighty way. So David said in Psalms 51, 16, You do not desire sacrifices, or else I'd give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you have desired. That's what the Lord wants. You look at David's life. Was David a righteous man on the outward's appearance? Committed, he committed sin with Bathsheba. He killed Uriah. Uriah was a righteous man. You look at Uriah's life and how much he loved his wife, but yet how much he loved the king more than his own wife. Wouldn't even go to bed with her when the king called him back because the king had impregnated Bathsheba. And yet, look at how God used David why? Because David's heart was broken. He did those things and it tore him up inside because he knew they were wrong. And yet for whatever reason, the flesh that he could not control or, or have power over, and yet his heart was so broken that he would, could never measure up to man's rule or even God's. And yet God used him because that heart was so broken, so contrite. So useless. And so I say, how can you use me, God? You know, I look at my life it's like, okay, Lord, it doesn't make any sense at all but that you, be, you receive the glory completely. Religion, it doesn't work with the Lord. So what do we do? Verse 16, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fathers. Plead for the widows. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, that is double dyed. I mean, just dark. They shall be white as snow. Though they are like red crimson, they shall be as wool. Isn't that awesome? God doesn't change. If you humble yourself and you come to him and say, Lord, just wash me, cleanse me by the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord. And he says, I'll make you white as snow. He's so good to do that. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So in other words, be real with God. Even though there's sin penetrating the very core of your heart, God is freely offering you grace to return to him. That's how much he loves us. How the faithful city has become a harlot, he says, and this is speaking spiritually. It was full of justice, righteous, logged in, lodged in it, but now murderers. Your silver has become dos, your wine mixed with water. Your prince are rebellions, rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. That is the political, you know, taking the bribes and like their rewards and like to be seen by men and, and so forth. They do not defend the fatherless, nor, do, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. 
Therefore the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemy. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dos and take away all your alloy. I restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterwards, you shall be called the city of righteousness and faithful city. Now he's talking about the future, right? Because that hasn't happened yet. But he's going to do it. He promises and it's going to happen for Israel one day. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her uh, penance with righteousness. The destruction of transgressors and of sinners shall be together and those who forsook the Lord shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the terebinth tree. Now, the terebinth tree and the gardens, these are actually cultural cults at that time. So this is what they were involved in. And he was saying, you're going to be ashamed of these cults that you believe in which you desire, and you shall be embarrassed because of the gardens, the cult, which you have chosen. For you shall be a terebinth tree with leaves faded, and as a garden that has no water, the strong shall be a tender, and the work of it as a spark. Both will burn together, and no one shall quench them completely. One day, at the end, God is going to restore Israel completely at that day. And one day... God is going to work in you, and you will be perfect. You'll stand in his presence as a bride adorned by his groom, white and holy and pure, acceptable. Ephesians tells us we already sit there, but we're not there, are we? Because we still sin. We still fall short of God's glory. Yeah, we still do. <clears throat> you know, I'm not the greatest leader. I started thinking about this. This conference just caused me to just think, and I just started listing all my flaws down this morning as I was on my own praying and just said, Lord, I, I still have this and this and this. And a leader, I don't know how to lead, Lord. I don't know why you even put me in this position. I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I, I get these guys together, and I'm in my head going, what am I going to tell them? What am I gonna, how am I going to show them? How, you know, and so forth. And I'm just like, how am I going to do this, Lord? I can't do this, Lord. But then I just take a step of faith and I say, oh, you're going to have to do it through me somehow. You're going to have to give me direction. You're going to have to help me. And at the conference, it was pretty neat because I've been dealing with this quite often since we've started these discipleship classes. I'm like, what do I teach them? What, what book do I go through? How do I, you know? And then all of a sudden, um, one of the teachers said, you ought to be teaching them what you learned. I'm like, wow, how simple was that? I'm like, that's easy. Teach them what I learned. Because then I can just tell them what I learned when they ask a question. You know? Well, you know, I'm having trouble in this ministry with this person. Okay, then get on your knees and just pray for them. That's what I used to do. Wow, that's so much easier than going, okay, what do I tell them? How to handle this and, and what to say? And you know, Just get on your knees and pray. Just That's what I would do. Just teach them what you were taught and what you learned. In other words... You're going to make them into who you are and what God has made you in that ministry, in that place. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. That was so simple. And now I have it down as one of my, my, my philosophies in my ministry. Another one that I have is that when I approach people, I am to love, I am to respect, but I'm to share truth. And that's something I've been trying to practice. Because when I approach people, sometimes I, I just share the truth. But I don't share the love and I don't share the respect. And so now I have that down as my philosophy. You know, I'm trying to just, I love you. I love you. You're a brother in Christ. You know, you're a believer. And I love you. And I respect you. You're a father. You're a husband. You work hard. You know, you give up of your time. I respect that. But here's the truth. I'm, I don't mean to offend you or anything, but this is the truth. This is what the Word of God says. This is what the philosophy we have here. And that's the way it is. And you just do it that way. Is it received? Not always, but... It, it's a good tool to use, you know, that the Lord has just been showing me. And so it's like, I'm not a good leader. He goes, I know. That's why I'm giving you these tools so that you can lead, you know. So he's faithful. He's always faithful. So we come to chapter 2, the word concerning Judah and Jerusalem. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So these are future tense events. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. Now this is future tense. One day Jerusalem will be there and all nations will flow to Jerusalem. Can't you just see it? 
We'll be in our houses and our places here on earth or in heaven. And we're like, let's go to Jerusalem. Fly to Jerusalem. And then Jesus will be there and he'll begin to teach us. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountains of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and he shall walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. That's going to be a glorious time. But there's no more war. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they have filled the eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased with the children of foreigners. Their land is full of silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Now, the residue of Solomon, right? The horses, the chariots. And that's the thing that they were all depending upon, their wealth, their materialism. There's another area. We depend on our wealth and materialism, don't we? We don't change. We think that it's us that provides for us, and it's not. It's the Lord. You know? and, and, and so we, we miss out because we think, no, I can't go to the men's breakfast because I have to work in order to make money. And so you sacrifice spiritual things for material things. That's what he's talking about here. And that's wrong. I've learned that you have to sacrifice material things for spiritual things. It's the opposite. See, the world says it's the other way around. That needs to be corrected. Seek ye first what? The material things and then the kingdom of God will add all these other things to you? No. Seek ye first what? the kingdom of God, and then all these other things will be added unto you. That's something I learned a long time ago. You know, I, I worked for Edison, you know, and I made good money, and I worked a lot of overtime, but it never interfered with what was going on at church. If it was a Wednesday night, I'd work all the way up until it was 7 o'clock and I was here ready to go. If it was a Sunday and they wanted us to work, I said, nope, can't work. I got Sunday services. It was a Sunday morning and there was a men's breakfast. I can't come at this time, but if you want me afterwards, I'll go afterwards. I always put God first. I always made the spiritual things first. And God has blessed us because of it, because he promises to. And I know that seems different than what we have been taught in this world, but that's the way God's economy works. You put him first and he takes care of you. You put him second and guess what? You'll be working harder. Because that's what you're working for. Now, if there's a Saturday and they say, you, we'd like you to work and there's no men's breakfast, nothing going on, guess what? I go, I go to work. There's nothing going on, so I go to work. Thank you, Lord. I get to work this Saturday. But put him first. That's what was going on here. They were into their silver, their gold, into their treasures, their horses, their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They worship the work of their hands that which their own fingers have made. People bow down and each man humbles himself. Therefore, do not forgive them. So they have a tendency of worshiping the creation, creation instead of the creator. That's humanism at its core, right? Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord, the glory of his majesty. The lofty look of a man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall bow down and the Lord shall... The Lord all alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon, all, upon every high tower, upon every fortified wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish, upon all the beautiful slopes. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, but the idols he shall utterly abolish. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. When he arises to shake the earth mightily, in that day a man will cast away his idols of silver 
and his idols of gold, which they made, each for himself to worship, and the moles and the bats, to go into the cliffs of the rocks and into the crags of the rugged rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. Severe, sever yourselves from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils for of what account is he? See, one day this will all be over and God will humble every proud man. And every knee will bow and every voice will confess that he is Lord and he will shake the earth. Chapter 3. Because of the sin of Israel, there was a shortage of food and water and all those things that they needed at that time. So he talks about that. Verse 1, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water, the mighty men and the mighty and the men of war, the judge and the prophet, and the divider and the elder, the captain of fifty and the honorable, the counselor, the skillful artisan, and the expert enchanter. I will give children to their prince, and babes shall rule over them. The people will be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child will be insolent towards the elder and the base towards the honorable. When a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have clothing, you be our ruler, and let him ruin be under our power. In that day, he will protest, saying, I cannot cure your ills, for in my house is neither food or clothing. Do not make me a ruler of the people. It's going to be so bad that there really isn't any hope for help because of the lack of medication, the lack of food, the lack of um, provisions that they that they need. So, why is God going to wipe them out? He explains here in the judgment, verse 8, for Jerusalem stumbled and Judah has fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of of the Lord. <clears throat> Verse 9. The look on their countenance witnesses against them, and they declare their sins as Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their souls, for they have brought evil upon themselves. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with them. For the reward of their hands shall be given to them. As for my people, children are oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, those who lead, you cause you to err and destroy the way of your path. The Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his prince. For you have eaten up the vineyards. The plunder of the poor is in your house. What you do means by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord of hosts. Then we have this sinful woman that he talks about in verse 16. Moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty or proud and walk with outstretched necks, wanting eyes, walking, walking and menacing as they go, making a jingling with their feet. They were enticing, you know those around them, and so forth. Therefore the Lord will strike with the scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will uncover their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the finery, finery, <clears throat> the jingling ankles and the scarves and the crescents and the pendants, the bracelets, the veils, the headdress, the leg ornaments, the headbands, the perfume, boxes, charms, rings, nose, jewels, uh, apparel, mantles, outer garments, purse. He's going to just take everything away. Verse 24, and so it shall be, instead of a sweet smell, there will be a stench. Instead of a stash, a rope. Instead, a well-set hair, baldness. Instead of a rich robe, a girding of sackcloth. 
branding instead of beauty. Branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty in the war. Her gates shall lament and mourn and she bring desolation or desolate shall sit on the ground. See, God desires a daily relationship with Jerusalem. But it was something that um, they did not they did not consider. And so God took took everything away from them completely. <clears throat> now you think of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and their sin. And because of their lust for the flesh, look what was taken away from them. And, and God does that. We like to hear the love of God and, and it's there and it's great and He does love us. He's compassionate and forgiving when we're asking for it. But if not, and we get, like He described the woman with the long neck, you know, you're not going to move me, I'm stubborn, you know, and I don't care, then He will take it away. He will take it away like He did with Sodom and Gomorrah. The desperate condition of these daughters of Zion, look at verse or chapter 4 now, it's a shorter chapter. In that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own food and wear our own apparel, only let us call, be called by your name and take away our reproach. In other words, at that time, the, the scarcity of, of men will be happening. And so these women are saying, you know what, have our, have our children, let us take on your name. There will be seven women for one man which I can't imagine that. Then we come to the branch of the Lord. And he's speaking of Christ here in verse 2 on. And that day the branch of the Lord, this is Christ that he's speaking about, shall be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. It shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is Recorded among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion, above her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a covering and there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime from the heat of and for a place of refuge, and for a shelter from the storm and from the rain. Zechariah 3 tells us that this branch is the servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ. And one day when Jesus returns to the earth, he's going to rule and reign in righteousness. You know, everything will be right. There will be, everything will be okay. And will be well with the church. Israel will be reestablished as God's bride. In the Old Testament, when you look at the relationship between God the Father and Israel, they're always considered a bride of the Father. In the New Testament, everything will be right with the church, the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. He is the groom. And so we have this relationship with Christ. Israel has this relationship with the Father. And so everything will be in heaven right as they rule and reign in righteousness. Now we come to a parable to end tonight's uh, study parable of an unproductive vineyard. Now, the Bible always looks at vineyards as Israels or types of Israel. Okay, so anytime you, you, you read in the New Testament about a vineyard, it's always speaking to Israel. Either how unproductive they were or unfruitful, whatever it is, or they're barren or whether they're flourishing. And then he does relate us as branches on the vine. And so we are grafted on that, and we see that in John chapter 15, grafted onto that uh, vine with Israel, and we become joint heirs with them. We're adopted into the family of God. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding my, or his vineyard, verse 1. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared it out its stones, and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And so God provided everything that Israel needed to be fruitful, and yet it wasn't fruitful. 
it brought forth wild grapes. And wild grapes don't taste very good. You want the good grapes, the grapes that are tasty. And he says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. In other words, judge the situation. You tell me if this isn't true. What more, and by the way, that's the way that you interpret scriptures. As you're sitting there and you're listening, you tell me if if I'm not right. If I'm not right, I'm not right. But you make the judgment. You tell me if, if, if what God is saying here is right or, or wrong. You, know? you be the judge of what is written. What more could you have been done? What more could have been done in my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard, that is Israel. I will take away its hedge. It shall be burned and break down its walls and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up ber- berries and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So he makes it clear there who he's talking about, Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plants. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So God has provided for Israel completely, everything that they needed, and yet they were not fruitful. God desires that we be fruitful as Christians. You have to be fruitful. You cannot be a Christian and not be fruitful. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, we go to John chapter 15, and he talks about Jesus being the true vine, Father is the vine dressers, and every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he says, I'll take it away. Every branch that bears fruit, I will prune it, and it will bring forth more fruit. So he talks about fruit that's on the vine, bringing forth fruit. Well, what's fruit? Well, go, go Galatians chapter five twenty two, and we have the fruit of the spirits, the love, the joy, the peace, and all of those things. What else is fruits? Using the spirit's gifts that he has given to us. You need to be using your gifts and bringing forth fruit in your life. You cannot just sit there and have no fruit. As a believer, he wants fruit, he expects fruit from you. He expects it from you. Every one of us should have fruit in our lives. It's what Jesus expected. It's what God expected from Israel. And he said, if you don't want to bring forth good fruit, then I'm going to take your video, I'm going to burn it up until you give me some good fruit. And of course, they will do that eventually. And the same with us. If you don't bring good fruit, he's going to prune you. He's going to prune you until you bring forth that fruit. He says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they burn. But if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. And so disciples bear fruit. Where's your fruit? What are you bearing? You you need to ask yourself that. You you need to be doing something for the Lord. I learned that from the the start. As soon as the Lord saved my soul, I said, Lord, what what can I do for you? Not to make you happy. I mean, not, not to receive from you anything, you know, not to justify my relationship with you, but just because I want to serve you. I want to give you fruit. You know? So whatever it is, if it's cleaning toilets, I'll clean toilets. If it's a parking lot, I'll do parking lot. Whatever it is, Lord, I want to do something for you. That's the attitude of a child to their parents. And so you need fruit. Now we come to the six woes to those who have no fruit. Verse 8, woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell along in the midst of the land. In my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, truly many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitants. For 10 acres of vineyard shall yield one bath and a homer of seed shall yield one ephod. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink who continue until night, till wine inflames them. The harp and the string, the tambourine, the flute, the wine are in their feasts, but they do not regard the work of the Lord. I mean, they'll party and they'll have fun, but the work of the Lord, forget it. It's on the sideline. Got to be faithful with the work of the Lord. You 
have to be faithful with the work of the Lord. As I said earlier, you know, God has entrusted you as good stewards with the ministry. Be faithful with it. If other things come in the way of that ministry and your faithfulness to it, then your priorities are mixed up and you have to get them back right. No, the Lord comes first and then the other things will come. And I'll guarantee you, he'll bless you because of that, because your priorities are correct. Having good priorities. These people had the wrong priorities. Let's, let's eat, let's drink, let's get drunk, let's party, let's get intoxicated, you know. Forget the work. Let's have the tambourines, the flutes. Therefore, verse 13, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished and their multitudes dried up with thirst. Therefore, Sheol, which is hell, the holding place, shall enlarge itself and open its mouth beyond measure. Their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he who is jubilant shall descend into it. People shall be brought down. Each man shall be humbled and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God who is holy shall be hollowed in righteousness. Then the lambs shall feed in their pastures, and in the waste places of the fat one, one strangers shall eat. Then more wolves. Woe, verse 18, to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if with a cart rope. In other words, they're just full, and they're pulling it with their cart that say, let him make speed and haste his work, that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near to come, and come, that we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good, and good evil. Boy, we see that today, right? We're evil. The Christian church is evil in the world. We're the evil people. You know, We're the ones that feed the poor. We're the ones that help the homeless. We're the ones that change... Uh, that God uses to change lives and yet we're considered evil and we need to be getting rid of in order for society to grow. And yet society is good. Homosexuality is good. Uh, we're the ones that are evil trying to push our moral values on them. Have you ever, have you ever even seen a, a gay pride parade and what goes on? There's, you know, we have a parade and we can parade down a certain street and we're wholesome we got the floats or the cars and dressing up and everyone's having a good time and playing their instruments and stuff. And it's nice. But you ever see a gay parade? See, now they're good, but we're evil. But you go to their parades and they're naked and they're dancing around. They're flaunting it and they're going to people that are on the sidelines protesting. And in their faces they're screaming and yelling and they're angry. And they rip themselves naked in front of them and flash and all that stuff. This is, this is good. And this is the day and age that we live in. The thing that is evil is looked at as good and the thing that is good is looked at as evil and we see it. And it's going to grow worse. It's going to grow worse as we get closer to the end. It says, who put darkness for light and light for darkness? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. In other words, we're, ju- we're to judge by God's standards and by his word, not what we think is wise in our own eyes. God has written his word for a reason, and it's, it's clear right here. When I was speaking with, to the Jehovah Witness, <clears throat> she had uh, been questioning why the church would um, keep certain information away from people. You know, and I said, the church hasn't kept information away from people. It's all right here in the Word of God, and you just have to go to it. No, the church recently has kept it away. No, it's right here in the Word of God, and it's always been there. You could go back 2,000 years, or 3,000 years, or 4,000 years, and you'll find it right there. It's just that you haven't sought it out. And so trying to put the blame on an organization instead of, of realizing it's me, and I haven't sought the Word out to find out what truth is. And it's right here in front of our eyes. God's standards, God's rules, God's guidelines for our lives is right here. Right here. We need to read this. And when we make decisions, our decisions are to be based upon this right here and why we make them. Every decision from our relationships to our children to our work and what we do, how we raise up our children, how we live in society is all based right here. We get all the principles of righteousness and truth and and character and so forth right here. 
So you don't go into politics, you know, and you think, well, now I can party and 